Hi, I'm Kenny Yates. Welcome to Hold the Hope. And this is a regular weekly message, and today's message is entitled, Heaven or Hell, Your Choice. But first, just a few housekeeping things. YouTube strikes again. Last week's message, Hijacking the Human Genome, Part 2, was taken down. And all I did was quoted the, the, the experts in a field of study on um, the algorithms that they can run on human beings. And YouTube chose to take it down saying that I violated their policies. So if you are interested in um, seeing that message, Hijacking the Human Genome, Part 2, it's on our Hold the Hope dot org website or you can view it on rumble okay now our message heaven or hell your choice so would you please turn with me to deuteronomy chapter 30 verse 19 through 20 i call heaven and earth to witness against you today that i have set before you life and death Blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that you and your offspring may live. Loving the Lord your God, obeying his voice and holding fast to him, for he is your life and length of days. God has set before each and every one of us the choice of life or death, blessing or cursing. He desperately wants us to choose life. He wants us to choose blessings. I've met so many people who say when I ask them if they believe in God, they are like, yes, I believe in God. I'm, I'm actually a Christian. I'm a member of so-and-so church and I, I go to church. And the problem is, is that they're, they're not living the life that the exemplary life they will drop the f-bomb and they, they they talk about vulgar stuff and they they act like they don't know who god is like god is not a presence in their life or they're reeking of alcohol you know they they're not displaying the the, the typical christian life and they don't understand or they don't know the first thing about scripture they they don't understand or know about holiness about righteousness what i'm saying is there is a right way to live and there's a wrong way to live choose the right way so just to believe that there is a god or to believe that God exists is not enough. James said in his letter, James chapter 2, verse 19, you believe that there is one God. Good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. Demonic entities believe that there is a God. They believe that he exists, but that is not enough. There is more, there is much, much more to it than just believing that there is a God or believing that there's something up there. There's much, much more to that. You must change from the inside out. You must change the way you talk. You must change the way you act, even the way you think. The things that you imagine or the things that you fantasize about. Proverbs chapter 23 verse 7 says, For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. As the Chinese philosopher Lao Tzu said, Watch your thoughts, they become your words. Watch your words, they become your action. Watch your actions, they become your habits. Watch your habits, they become your character. Watch your character... It becomes your destiny. I suggest that the first thing that we get a handle on is our thoughts. We, we have to get a handle on our thoughts. Then we have to get a hold of our words. That should be our first priority to get under control because it all spirals downwards from there. It all goes downhill from there. 
You can no longer let whatever's on your mind come gushing out of your mouth. Consider the consequences. Consider the repercussions of your words upon the ears of your hearers. The impact that it makes. I remember several years ago in our younger days when my wife first became a, a manager and she was the head of, of software development. And she was in a meeting with her staff and she was throwing some ideas out there, some suggestions and it's it's just hypothetical situations that she was talking about. She was not expecting these suggestions to be carried out or to be implemented. The next thing she realizes is that everything that she threw out there in the meeting was implemented, which wasn't a bad thing. It just wasn't what she was expecting to be done. She was only casting a hypothetical vision. She didn't realize how much power her words carried as head of software development and her staff, um, it, it impacted her staff highly. And it's the same with us. It's the same with those who look at us as examples. Our words, our actions are impactful to those who hear, those who see, especially our children, especially our grandchildren, especially our loved ones, those who see us day in and day out, hear our words. Our words carry a lot of weight. I went to visit a, a, a lady in, in the hospital just a few days ago, and she said that she wasn't ever going back to church because of her grandfather. Apparently, he was the pastor, and he used to abuse his wife, her grandmother, and he would use some unwholesome uh, language as well. She witnessed all of this as a little girl, and it left a bad taste in her mouth. So she, she decided that she was never wanted to go back to church. She didn't want to have anything to do with church. But praise the Lord, I was able to lead her to Christ. You see, some people say that, that we come as we are, and we do. We come as we are. The song says, come as you are. And I believe that we should. We, we can't go, we can't clean ourselves up. I, I don't believe that, that, that we can get our, our lives all in order and get it all right and then come to Jesus. I believe that's why we come to Jesus, because Jesus fixed broken things. Jesus heals broken hearts. Jesus put broken things back together, put broken people back together. So we come to Jesus just as we are. But we do not, and we cannot, and we must not stay as we are. We must change as we are led by the Holy Spirit. So we need to grow. We need to, to uh, climb one step, as that song says, we climb one step higher every single day because we commune with Jesus. If we don't, we will begin to grow lukewarm. And listen to what God says about us growing lukewarm. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. For because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. God says he knows our deeds. Each and every one of us, God knows all of our deeds. There is nothing that catches him by surprise. There's nothing that catches him unawares. The writer of the book of Hebrews in Hebrews chapter 4 verse 13 says, Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Nothing escapes the attention of God. He knows all of our ways, all of our thoughts, all of our motives, all of our actions. He knows where we are and what we are doing every second of the day. God acts 
a rhetorical question in Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 24. He asked, can a man hide from God so that he cannot find him? The answer is no. No one can hide anything from God. He can't hide himself. He can't hide his, his actions. He cannot hide his thoughts. Everything is open and laid bare before him. And he weighs all of our words. He weighs all of our actions. He weighs all of our thoughts in the balance. And he ponders or considers all of our ways. God is a great, great God, loving and kind, merciful and forgiven. But we have to be obedient to his word and all that he has commanded us to do. So don't be fooled into thinking that all you need to do is to know who he is. And then you can go your merry little way and God can go his way. And we will all just meet up at a favorable time or in a favorable way at the judgment. It does not work like that. Listen to what Jesus said about people who thought they were doing his work, but had no relationship with him. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 through 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then will I declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. As you can hear, it doesn't work that way. You just can't come to God and just go about and do whatever it is that you want to do and have no relationship with him. You just can't get to do whatever you want to do. Have all your little, little things for your own self. There's a work for you to, to do. You don't get to go and do whatever you feel like doing. There is a way, the right way, walk ye in it. I mean, if nothing else, right, don't you want to be an example for your loved ones, for your children, your grandchildren, so that you, you might win them and lead them to Christ? But you know what? We're not evangelizing. We, we know we're no longer sharing the gospel. I was talking to a friend of mine, and I mentioned that I had visited one of my um, clients in a hospital and that I had led her to the Lord. He responded with, wow, that must feel wonderful. I've never done it. One statistic I read said that 63% of leadership in a certain denomination, including deacons and elders, have not led one stranger to Jesus in the last Two, week, two, two years through the method of go ye evangelism. Think about that. Over half has never experienced the joy of winning one soul to Christ. There's two things that I believe that the church has fallen down on. They're one. Sharing our faith with others, especially the unchurch. The church has fallen down on that. Number two, discipling those who are already in the church. There's no disciple program in the church. We don't train up workers to go and evangelize, go and share the good news. We don't teach them how to act. We don't teach them how to be good Christians. We don't teach them how to be an example in their communities, in their homes, in their workplaces. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 20 through 27 says, My son, be attentive to my words. Incline your ear to my sayings. Let them not escape from your sight. Keep them within your heart. 
for there are life to those who find them and healing to all their flesh. Keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flow the springs of life. Put away from you crooked speech. And that word translated crooked speech means perverse, moral corruption. We don't talk just any way. We have a, a right way to talk. So put away from you crooked speech and put devious talk far from you. Let your eyes look directly forward and your gaze be straight before you. Ponder the path of your feet, then all your ways will be sure. Do not swerve to the right or to the left. Turn your foot away from evil. Now, I want you to hear what Jesus said about those who just go about their own merry little way and have no regard for others, have no regard for the work that he has assigned you, who have assigned me. Matthew chapter 25, verse 41 through 46. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you accursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick, in prison, and you did not visit me. And they will answer, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? Then he will, he will answer them, saying, Truly I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. If you just sit around and not reach out to others, if you are not reaching out to, to others and ministering to others' needs, especially their spiritual needs, you are not reaching out to Jesus. These are the last days, and now is our last opportunity to minister to others, to reach others, to win souls for Jesus. Now is the time to give have, ha, ha, have you given to Jesus? How do we give to Jesus? By giving to others. That's how we give to Jesus. Remember what Jesus said. Truly I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. Whatever we do for others, we do for Jesus. We don't, it doesn't matter whether it's good or whether it's bad. Whatever we do for others, we do it for Jesus. When Jesus spoke to, to, to Saul on the road to Damascus, he said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And Saul, Saul was confused. He said, who, who are you, Lord? Who are you? Because he was unaware that he was persecuting Jesus. He thought he was only persecuting the church. He thought he was only persecuting Christians. Just people, ordinary people. People who, who, who were not, who were straying from, from, from the Jewish faith. These were the ones that he was persecuting. The truth is, whenever one of God's people is attacked, God is attacked. Whenever we do good to people, whether Christians or non-Christians, but especially Christians, we do it as unto God. We do it as unto Jesus. What am I talking about? I'm talking about choosing heaven by choosing to do what God has called us to do. No one is called just to sit around and then inherit eternal life. Everyone is called to work in the kingdom. I suggest that we get started working in the kingdom today because we don't have very much time left on this side of eternity. So whatever you're going to do to pass on to eternity, we need to do it now. Today is the day. Heaven and hell are set before us. Choose heaven. 
Heaven is a place of good things, blissfulness, peace, joy, full of heavenly pleasures. No more hunger, no more thirst, no more lack, no more tears, no more pain, no more sorrow, no more sad goodbyes. Neither is there any more fear of anyone or any fear of anything. We will not fear again. There will be no more temptations. It's a place where everyone gets along. There's no more anger, no more hurtfulness. Poverty will not even be a part of our vocabulary. Just think about it. No wishing for the weekend to hurry up and come. Or no more wishing that we had a few more days of vacation left. Or no longer wishing you had a few extra bucks just to get the essentials. You will have all the time in the world because it's eternity. Time will be no more. You will have all of your needs supplied. You will not be stressed out because of, of the traffic. It's so much traffic. There's traffic jam in front of you and you're running late for work. All of that will be in the past. And best of all, Jesus will be there. We'll be able to commune with Jesus face to face. We will join everyone in worshiping the sacrificial lamb of God. No one will be left out and no one will refuse to join in the worship. Such peace, such joy. All of our loved ones, those who have gone on before us and who have made it in, those who have accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior and, and have died in the faith, they will be there. We will be reunited with them. We will meet again on that day. All the saints of, all, of old, all the pre-flood and post-flood saints will be there. And the nice thing is, we won't have to make an appointment and explain to their personal secretary about the nature of our business or the nature of our visit with them. We can just go up to them and we can talk with them and chat with them and commune with them and worship with them. But you know, I hear a lot of people asking, why would a good God send someone to hell? And we, we have a video on that, so check that out. The link will be below. It's a good video. Check it out. I can answer that in two words. He doesn't. We must choose. Remember what our scripture said. I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing, therefore choose life. It's your choice. Do not blame that choice on God. We must choose life or we choose death. We either choose blessing or we choose cursing. It's not God's choice. This is what Peter wrote concerning God's wish, wish or God's desire. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. He wants us all to come to repentance. He wants us to turn away from our wicked ways and to seek his face, to call upon his name, to gain salvation from him. Because he offers it for free. He paid the price for us. The price we could not pay. He paid it. He took our sins upon himself. See, God is not in a real big hurry to come back and judge the world. He's patient, hoping that we will repent he does not wish for any of us to die and go to that place called the lake of fire. Listen to what he said to um, Ezekiel in Ezekiel chapter 33, verse 11. This is what he told him. He said, say to them, as I live, declares the Lord God, 
I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn back. Turn back from your evil ways. Why should you die? God is passionate about this. He does not want us to, to die and go to that place. It's not designed for us. It's designed for the devil and his angels. He does not want us to go there. He says, turn back. Turn back from your evil ways. Seek salvation. God takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. He does not want us to die and go there because it's for all eternity. You don't just go there, spend a few years or do your time and then you get out. It's for all eternity. In hell, the lake of fire is like this. The flames are never, ever quenched. The warm dieth not. It's anguish and pain, complete and total darkness, thirst and hunger gnawing of the tongue, suffering and torment, grief and sorrow, agony and misery. There is no peace, no joy, no comfort, nothing but loneliness and regret. God does not want you. He does not want me. He does not want anyone to go there. And neither do we. We want you saved. We want you to be in eternity with Jesus. Here is how you can avoid a place like the lake of fire. You have to accept Jesus and his free gift of salvation. Maybe you have never heard of Jesus. Maybe you have never understood what it is that Jesus offers us. Well, we were all destined to die. We're all destined for the lake of fire to go to hell. The only thing that could save us was a pure, unblemished sacrifice. So Jesus, the Son of God, volunteered to shed his own precious, sinless blood. A sacrifice that was without spot and without wrinkle. He chose to take all the sins of the world on himself and to die on the cross, a sacrifice for many. He gave, he gave up his own life that we might have life. But on the third day, he rose again and he is now seated at the right hand of God the Father. He's making intercessions for us. And one day he's coming back to get us so that where he is, we can be also. And that day is very, very soon. So to, to receive his salvation, all you have to do is to ask. If you're ready to ask him for forgiveness and to make a commitment to live for him, pray this prayer with me. I'll lead you in this prayer and you follow it and mean it from the heart. If you confess with your mouth and believe with your heart, you will be saved. Pray this prayer with me. Heavenly Father, forgive me of my sins. I am sorry that I broke your commandments. I'm sorry that I strayed away from you. Forgive me. Help me to live for you. Help me to be an example in my home, my community, my workplace. And I give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. If you pray that simple prayer, the Lord is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Here's what you'll need to do. Get yourself a Bible, buy a highlighter, read your Bible every single day, get on a plan. And you can, you can download um, Bibles on your phones, but I would suggest that you read your Bible because the eyes are, this, are, are the, are, are the um, doorway to your soul. 
This, this is how you build up your faith. So read your Bible. Highlight the promises that Jesus made. He's faithful and just to, to, to keep his promises. Every promise that he's made, he will keep it. So stand on those promises. Believe in those promises. And when he comes back, you'll find you doing what it is you're supposed to be doing. Now, the next thing I want you to do is to find yourself a Bible-believing church, one that still believes in holiness, that still believes in righteousness, that still believes that there is a way that we should live, a way we should talk, a way that we should act, a right way. Join that church, not one of those progressive churches that embraces the things of the world. Turn away from those, those churches and find a Bible-believing church, a church of holiness. And join that church. Be discipled in that church. And when Jesus comes back, like I said, he'll find you doing what it is you're supposed to be doing. And we'll all meet on that wonderful day when he comes back to get us. Pray for your loved ones. Witness to your loved ones. Tell them how much that God has done for you. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Kenny Yates. This is Hold the Hope. Be blessed and stay blessed.